On this two-part special edition of Life in the Grooves, I talk with Grammy Award-winning conductor, composer, arranger, and trumpeter, Jeff Tysick. As one of America's most innovative and sought-after Pops Orchestra conductors, Jeff is recognized for his brilliant arrangements, original programming, and engaging rapport with audiences of all ages. Tysick studied both classical and jazz at the prestigious Eastman School of Music, where he earned both his bachelor's and master's degrees. He has led the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra as its principal pops conductor for more than 27 years, and is also the principal pops conductor for the Dallas Symphony, the Detroit Symphony, and the Oregon Symphony Orchestra. Jeff has composed and produced theme music for many of the major television networks and released six of his own albums on Capitol, Polygram, and Amherst Records. In part one of my conversation, Jeff talks about how he had to adapt and create new programming for orchestras during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of the bigger orchestras will have 60 strings just to get that really rich sound. Well. We had to use sometimes a string section that had 10 people in it. It was crazy. Looking back on some of his earliest musical memories, Tysick recalls the lasting impression and impact these experiences had on his career. When I was in sixth grade, I got to play a solo in front of the band, and it was called Johnny Learns to Play. I'll never forget this piece. And it's where, where you start off sounding really, really bad, and then by the end of the piece, you sound good. And the thought in my head was, wow, this makes people happy. And we also talk about the years Jeff spent working with Grammy award-winning jazz trumpeter and flugelhornist Chuck Mangione. One day he just said, we're gonna work on this album and I, I want you to come out and be in the studio. I said, what am I doing? He said, well, I just want you to be in the studio. And uh, ended up producing, <laughs> basically, before I even knew what the heck I was doing. I'm Charles Urich, and this is Life in the Grooves. We invite you to visit our website at lifeinthegrooves.com, where you can subscribe, listen to your favorite episodes, or follow us on your favorite podcast app. And be sure to check out our new YouTube channel at Life in the Grooves Podcast. And now, here is part one of my conversation with Jeff Tysick. I want to start with what you have been working on over the last 14 months. It seems as though musicians, you know, really had to find unique and creative ways to present their material. So as a composer, arranger, and conductor, what impact did the pandemic have on your work, and how did you adjust? Well, a year ago, March, when everything came crashing down, uh, I lost, I would say, probably 20 concerts, 20 weeks worth of concerts, and there was no uh, sort of definite plan forward. Orchestras were scrambling. Mm -hmm. uh, all the orchestra musicians were getting together and figuring out if they were going to play, what were the protocols going to be that would protect protect them against getting the virus. And so it created this crazy circumstance where people wanted to play, the orchestras wanted to stay uh, visual, they wanted to stay relevant, they wanted to keep reaching their audiences, but they didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I said to my manager, Jamie, I said, we need to come up with some programs for orchestras and for the orchestras I'm working with that are uh, inexpensive, that also work for small groups of musicians. Because as this pandemic hit, I, I'll, I remember I was supposed to go to Dallas and I got a call from the artistic guy who said, well, you know, we were gonna do this film music program with 75 players, but we can only use 45. And I said, wow, 45, let me look at the music. And I said, well, I think we can just make it work with 45. And then he called a few days later and said, well, now it's only 35. I said, <laughs> well, we're going to have to change the repertoire. Then he called a few days later and said, well, now we can only have 25 people on stage. I said, there's no possible way we're going to do this. So they, they went ahead and did some chamber music, but it started me thinking, 
of creating music that we could play during the pandemic with a bunch of orchestras. So the first thing I came up with was a, a concert called Ragtime Kings. And it was all music from the late 1800s, I would say 1895 up until about 1920. And it was music of Jelly Roll Morton and Scott Joplin and W.C. Handy. Uh -huh. And the, the bands back then were actually pretty small. So you could play this music in an authentic way and have it sound like it's supposed to sound. So I created that concert. And I ended up first doing it with Dallas and then another orchestra wanted it and then another orchestra. And I think by the time we got finished, Jamie has, uh, you know, uh, booked that with 20 orchestras over the year because wow. they were they all needed something to play. And when I say, you know, a smaller orchestra, it was because the wind players, if you blow into an instrument and you're moving air on stage you have to be 12 feet from the nearest player. So it to get these people on stage, it took up so much room on the floor of the stage to seat everybody and have them socially distanced. And it, it was crazy. So I did that program uh, and I came up with a Latin program that worked. And then Detroit, I was supposed to go to Detroit Symphony and work with a, a Cirque group. Uh, there are these Cirque groups that they do their aerials and their acrobatics to mm -hmm. classical music. Well, you know, they do it to masterworks like Dvorak, Sasson, Dance Macabre by Sasson, you know, or Smetna, uh, Dance of the Comedians, or Bizet, Carmen Suite. Well, all those pieces are written for large orchestra. So I ended up reorchestrating, meaning I took music that was meant to be played by 12 brass and 12 woodwinds and then strings and, and the rest of it down to only five brass and five woodwinds. Wow. And I had, I had to make it sound as close to the original as I can, because you can't just say, oh, I'm going to leave out the second trumpet or the third horn. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. You really have to go in, reimagine what the harmonies are and put all the essentials parts and solos in. So to the, answer the the shorter answer to your question is is since last august i have reduced for orchestra about 70 pieces about three to four hours worth of music and also during that time i created a blues concert uh featuring shana Steele, who uh, is this incredible vocalist uh, who sings with Bette Midler and Chris mm -hmm. Bodie and different people. Uh, she had a lead on Hairspray on Broadway, amazing singer. And I created this blues show of all, again, music of Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey uh, and Billie Holiday. Uh, and it's a phenomenal concert, and now orchestras are booking that as well. So uh, it's it's been quite a ride trying to come up with music to keep orchestras in business, and that was sort of my mission. What other type of adjustments had to be made? Did musicians have to change anything about their technique? No, there were no, there were really no adjustments to how they played. But unfortunately, you know, to get a string, a really wonderful string sound, you need to have at least 34 players on stage. Some of the bigger orchestras will have 60 strings just to mm -hmm. get that really rich sound. Well, we had to use sometimes a string section that had 10 people in it. Wow. And so what you had to do in your mind, if you're a classical music lover, you know, there are these wonderful chamber works like uh, Copland's Appalachian Spring. I mean, it's written specifically for 14 people and a small group. Mm -hmm. So you had to reimagine these masterworks played in a chamber music style uh, because the string, strings can only put out so much sound. That's why they need so many of them. And then we, you know, we had to get into miking the strings and 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 that kind of thing. But but the other thing I, I forgot to mention to you about the pandemic was there were no live audiences. We were right. doing all this to be captured on video and either streamed live or then uh, released at a later date. So we were playing to nobody except a camera and to people who we thought would be tuning in. Uh, so there was no reaction coming back, um, early on in the process in Texas and in, uh, uh, you know, in, in Detroit, in Dallas and Detroit, they were letting in maybe 50 people in a 2000 seat room. <laughs> and I, but I will tell you, 50 people can make a hell of a racket when they applaud in a 2000 seat room, you know? 
But only in the past few months have we been getting a quote unquote audience. And, and by that, I'm talking only up to 200 people. And, you know, one of the interesting things for me from a standpoint of humanity was once orchestras said, okay, we're going to figure this out. We're going to have 25 players. We're going to socially distance everybody. We're going to do this by streaming. There'll be no people in the audience. Everyone's going to be tested. I mean, when I go to Dallas at that time, I was tested every day. I, I tested four times in five days while I was there. Everybody, you couldn't get in the building unless you were tested, if you were a stagehand, mm -hmm. whoever you were. Yep. So you could see on the first few times, first few concerts we did, the musicians came in and they were, you could tell they were scared. They really didn't want to be around each other. I mean, they missed it, each other, but they were like, they were afraid. Mm -hmm. And once they started to play music, you saw this thing happen where it was, oh my God, I've missed this. Wow. This is who I am. You know, you, I could see this happening. Um, and it was such a, a heartwarming experience to, to watch these sort of flowers just start to unfold again, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that went on and, and then we're playing, you know, under these crazy conditions where distance people can't hear each other, you know, the social distancing, the strings are wearing their masks and the brass and winds, they take them off and they got to put them, all the stuff that's going on. And then about... Two months ago, when real people walked in the room, it was unbelievable. I mean, the musicians were like, wow, people are here. We're playing for people, <laughs> you know? Amazing. And you could feel that emotion going back and forth between the audience and the orchestra. I mean, it, I, and I, you know, and the conductor, I mean, one of the cool things about a conductor, bad or good, you're sort of in that place between the audience and the orchestra. So right. the energy is kind of flowing through you both ways. And mm -hmm. it, I'll tell you, it was magical. Uh, two weeks ago, I was uh, conducting the Buffalo Philharmonic, and it was the first time in a year and a half they had people in the audience. And I think we had about 200 people. And you could tell both the audience and the orchestra, they, they were so happy and they were so moved by the experience. I mean, it was, it was incredible. That was the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by my guest today, Jeff Tysick, with a piece that he composed called Transitions. Now, this overture sounds as though it may have been inspired by a military band or a drum and bugle corps because of the amount of brass and uh, percussion that are featured here. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I did play in a drum corps, uh, you know, uh, for a few years in high school and I'm, and I'm a brass guy. So, you know, I, I do tend to uh, use a lot of brass and percussion and things, but transitions was the first concert as a pops conductor with the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra 28 years ago. And I wrote it as a, uh, a statement actually of transitioning from the past to the future and having on this pops concert many different influences i think and we you know we played jazz on that concert and a bunch of different things but i wrote this overture to say that you're going to hear things that you've never heard before and they're going to be interesting new and different and so that piece is a very meaningful piece to me uh it originally was a four minute piece and then i, I went back later on for the recording and and added more material to it and it became an eight minute uh, overture for orchestra so speaking of transitions, I do want to transition back to some of your first musical experiences, um, early mentors, uh, first teachers. What were some of the moments that stood out for you? Yeah, well, you know, I think I was about, uh, I, was, I was in third grade, I think. So I think that makes me about eight years old. And mm -hmm. I saw this uh, bugle, drum and bugle corps marching down the street 
uh, it was just drums and these guys playing the the military bugles. You know, they don't have any valves or anything, and that's what right. they play reveille and stuff on. Mm-hmm. And my birthday was coming up, and my mother said, uh, Is it, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, I want a bugle. I don't know why. I like the sound of it. And my birthday came, and I, there was a case. I opened it, and there was this weird-looking thing in there. It sort of looked like a bugle, but it had these buttons on it. And I was like, what is this? You know, and I, was, I think I was crying, you know? And it, it was a cornet. So my first teacher, his name was Elmer Musselman. He was 77 years old. And this is in the 60s, okay? Mm-hmm. So, and he had played in this famous band in New York called the Goldman Band in his early right. days. I read that they were like widely considered the successor to John Philip Sousa's right. band. Yeah. So he was a wonderful gentleman who taught me. And... Then as I went through school, I had some incredibly influential teachers. And also, I have to say, I came from a very dysfunctional family. Um, It was not a great experience. And music was something that really was my place that I could go to and express myself in a positive and interesting way. Uh, and feel good about like getting my emotions out through sounds that I played. So I think that was the beginning of me becoming, you know, thinking about writing music or or being attracted to music in in a way that was more than just an exercise or, or a fun thing to do. Um, so early on in, in high school, I had a couple experiences that really showed me something about music that I found attractive. One is when I was in sixth grade. I got to play a solo in front of the band and it was called Johnny Learns to Play. I'll never forget this piece. And it's where where you start off sounding really, really bad. And then by the end of the piece, you sound good. You know, you you make yourself sound bad and then you sound good. Mm -hmm. So when the piece ended, it was a final concert of the year. You know, it's great applause and everything. And I didn't, the thought in my head, I remember it. It wasn't like, oh, I'm so good. They love it. No, my thought was, wow, this makes people happy. So that was my first experience thinking about what music can do. The second experience, uh, when I, uh, a little bit later, around that same time, our, our elementary school had a marching band, which was crazy because elementary schools don't do that. But our mm-hmm. teacher had gone to Michigan State under this guy, William Ravelli, who was some famous marching band. She's like, we're having a marching band. And by the way, I hated it because we wore... Uh, black knee socks, black shorts, I don't like shorts, and a white shirt and a Robin Hood hat with a feather coming out of it. That was our costume, you know, and Mm. I hated looking like that. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, she called me up one night, and it was a memorial, we were going to march on Memorial Day, and she said, "Um, at the Roosevelt House tomorrow mansion, there's going to be a service at the graveside, and they would like a young trumpet player to come and play taps um, I, I said, I would ask you if you would do it. I said, Oh yes, Miss Holloway, I'll do it. So Memorial day, the next morning I'm out in front of my house, uh, dressed up like Robin hood. Uh, yeah, I have my case with me, a, a car stops, a, a guy with an American Legion hat picks me up and says, uh, yes, we're going to go over to the mansion. Okay. So we go over there. We walk back to the graveside and there are four guys in military uniforms with a chest full of uh, cabbages, they say, all the medals. Mm-hmm. And there's a color guard and Rose- uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and her son, John, and me. Wow. And I, I mean, I knew who she was. I was a very young person, you know, but I knew who mm-hmm. she was. But I, I, the magnitude didn't hit me till years later. But, you know, they had this ceremony and at the end I played taps. And I, I think... I think she said something to me. I, I, I kind of don't remember that. But I realized, wow, music can give you some incredible experiences. You can meet some amazing people through music uh, and do some amazing things. So, so those, those, the first two things, uh, you know, people, it, it, it affects people. And the other one is, you know, you can do uh, some amazing things. And then the third thing was in high school where I worked in a car wash weekends and then during the summer, I worked like five or six days in the car wash for a dollar five an hour, you know, trying to make money to pay music lessons and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I played tunes with my brother who played drums and this guy who played this thing called a Cordovox, which it looks like an accordion, but sounds like a Hammond B3 organ. Right. And mm-hmm. he was older than us. He said, hey, I got a job for us next 
week uh, on Friday night. I said, a job? What kind of job? He said, oh, we're going to play music in this bar. And back then you could get in the bar and play, I guess, if you were 13 or whatever it was. Right. I don't know. They, they just looked the other way. Right. So <laughs> he said, and we're going to play for two hours and we're going to be paid $15 each. And plus they're going to give us pizza and something to drink. And I thought, man, you can make money at music. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I learned those are the three things uh, that I think, you know, uh, I learned about, say, the music business. But, you know, music, the thing about music, it's a it's a discipline. You know, if you practice, you get better. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a thing about self-worth. And that's why I think it's great for kids. But I, I'll tell you what, I am still uh, back to the dysfunctional childhood and, and all. And even through adolescence, it was a really terrible experience for me to be. Uh, in that family, uh, my family. Um, but there were teachers who saw something in me and who were very supportive. My, my English teacher, who was married to my Spanish teacher, they were great people. And he inspired me. Uh, you know, we were doing uh, reports uh, on uh, different things we were studying. And one of them was Romeo and Juliet. And I said, I want to take Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet. And I want to show you what in the music are the sections that happen, where the sword fight is, where the death scene is, you know? So that, that was kind of a revelatory thing to me to get involved in what I call programmatic music, something that, you know, tells a story about music. So I am still in touch and they're in their eighties now. I'm still in touch with my uh, English and Spanish teacher who are still married. Wow. And also my band director, Jerry Conklin, who was one of the most uh, incredible people in my life, who was in his 80s. I, I just called him last week. I mean, I'm still in wow. touch with the people who have made a difference in my life, even though I'm, you know, I'm kind of getting on myself a bit, you know. What's so fascinating about your story is that you have these um, significant historical connections to um, great musicians and um, conductors as well as important figures in U.S. history. Well, I, I always say uh, life has exceeded my expectations. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that way. Um, and, and I have to keep slapping myself to stay motivated and try to do something new and interesting um, because, you know, it, it, it doesn't get easier, I think, as you get on, you know, in years uh, to, to be creative and to try to, you know, to find that juice to do something new and different when you've done so many things. From the 2018 CD release titled Images, that is the music of composer Jeff Tyzik featuring the Eastman Wind Ensemble with Ritual Dance. Now, I understand that this piece has a connection to works in an art gallery. Right. And um, how did this all come about? Uh, I was commissioned to write a suite of music to uh, honor the 100th anniversary of the Memorial Art Gallery in Rochester, New York. And I decided to write my own pictures as an exhibition, as Mazorsky had done. So I went into the art gallery and I, I chose 
seven different works of art and I wrote a piece of music based on the story that the that came to me from looking at the piece of art. So this was a a uh a relief uh in stone of these two dancers that were dancing and uh, I, I can't, it didn't have a title actually. It just was relief in stone Mayan, uh, 850 BC. Uh, and, and I thought, wow, what would it be like if there was a whole story of these dancers, you know, sort of dancing in this sort of sensuous way. And then all of a sudden, as time goes on, it becomes more like a Bacchanal and, and gets crazy. And I, I just imagined this scene of more dancers. And, and uh, so that, that was the story behind that piece. And it starts off, this one starts off with wind, woodwinds and percussion. And it's very evocative and very primitive sounding. And then it turns into like this huge blowout by the end. Now, this recording featured students from the uh, Eastman School of Music. And uh, I want to turn to your time at Eastman. And uh, in your bio, you describe it as a pivotal place in your development because you were exposed to people like um, Ray Wright, who is... Um, legendary and synonymous with um, the Radio City Music Hall Orchestra. Right. And another pivotal moment was working with the jazz great Chuck Mangione. Um, I want to start with Ray Wright. What did he see in you, and what was the most valuable piece of advice that he gave you? Well, the first thing is, at that school, you were never treated as a student. I was treated as a professional from day one. Mm -hmm. So, and that was the thing about Ray. Uh, I mean, we would have these recording sessions where we were writing pieces, arrangements or, or original pieces for orchestra and we'd have these recording sessions. And then what would happen is we'd go in, bring our pieces in and this is before computers and you're up all night copying your parts by hand. Mm -hmm. And Ray would be up there with your score and he would start to rehearse it. And if he found five mistakes where he had to stop the orchestra and talk to you, well, what is this note really supposed to be or whatever? Five mistakes, he'd turn the score over and say, next time when you come in here, this has to be right. And he, and that was it. Your time was gone. He'd go on to the next person. So he really made it like, man, if you're in a professional situation, this is what could happen. Uh, so that mm -hmm. was, I think, the most incredible part of, of working with him. And the other thing is, if he saw the validity of something, he was willing to do anything to make it happen. So my final piece at Eastman, I wrote a thing called Meeting of the Spirits. And it was for 60 voice chorus, nine piece improvisation group, and mm -hmm. 70 piece jazz orchestra. And I wanted to have some electronic music sounds coming from behind the audience from speakers up in the balcony. Wow. <laughs> and, and by the way, there are no speakers in the balcony. So I went into the recording studio and you, there weren't even synthesizers back then. I, d I did a thing using a grand piano where you press the, the sustain key down mm -hmm. and you play all these notes into it and you can hear the sound reverberating and then you push the faders up and you just get that weird sound, okay? Mm -hmm. So I told Ray I wanted to do this. And four days later, they're hoisting voice of the theater speakers up to the balcony. So he was into me. It was like Radio City, man. If this is what it takes, I'm going to make it happen. Yeah, he was into the experimentation of using whatever technology was available to you at that time. Absolutely. And actually, years later, when I left school and and I was you know, becoming a professional, and I started working with Lynn drum machines when they first came out and synthesizers mm -hmm. and stuff. You know, I'd be back in Rochester, we'd have lunch and he'd say, okay, tell me what's happening out there. You know, and the next thing I know, the school would have a Lynn drum machine and, and uh, you know, a DX7 uh, uh, synthesizer. I mean, he was always, you know, in networking with his people in the field to say, okay, what's the latest thing and let's mm -hmm. get it and make our students aware of it. Yeah, so he, he was a phenomenal man. Uh, you know, very encouraging, uh, but, you know, not uh, overly uh, gratuitous or friendly uh, just to be that way. I mean, it was all about being a professional and it was an incredible experience.
From his solo album, The Farthest Corner of My Mind, you're listening to the multi-talented Jeff Tysick on trumpet with Note Aroma, Night in Rome. Now, this was a piece that you co-wrote with the great Doc Severinsen, and um, as for the title, where did the Italian influence come from, and what were some of the other influences when you were creating this piece? Uh... Even though my name is Tysic, I'm half Italian. And the, the part of me that's Italian is the part that loves my wife, loves food, loves wine, and loves great music. So it's, I think, orchestral. It's jazz. Uh, it's jazz pop. But, but also there are some classical, like the ending on that, you know, it's, a, it's almost like a, a, the ending to a symphonic movement of something. So you can kind of see my crossover influences and what was in my head in those early years with that piece. And it definitely, without any question, there is uh, a Chuck Mangione influence in that piece. There just is. Now, Chuck was the director of the jazz ensemble at Eastman. He was when I was, uh, when I came to school. And uh, he was a very, very tough character. Uh, he was very demanding. Um, he was not, I mean, you know, he was, of course, educated, but I think he was a little more pedestrian in how he, uh, you know, approached music. Um, and, he, you know, he wrote really great pieces himself that were very unique and very different. And actually, he's one of the main reasons I ended up going to Eastman, because uh, a childhood friend of mine who was three years older than me, uh, went to Eastman and kept in touch with me. He said, you got to come here. There's this guy, Chuck Mangione, and sent me some of his recordings. And actually, his name is Chris Vidala, uh, amazing saxophone player who played on all of Chuck's hits. Um, and so he went on to play with Chuck for 14 or 15 years. And he it was an amazing person. But, you know, so I, I was in the jazz ensembles under Chuck, and he, he, was, uh, he was pretty, you know, he could be very caustic and very tough. Um, and, you know, he did one thing to me. I was, I was in the freshman band and I was playing lead trumpet. And there was a kid in town who, who was a wonder kid, a wonder kid. You know, he was about 15 years old, high school kid who could like, you know, play into the stratosphere of the trumpet. He was an amazing bebop player. And Chuck brought him into rehearsal and had him stand, stand next to me and blow me out of the room just to show, just to make a point. I'm not sure what the point was <laughs> but he made a point with me for sure the point was he's a tough character and this kid's brilliant why he did that i still don't know did but, that uh, kid go did that kid ever go on to have any kind of success as somebody no, we might know <laughs> no he was a very very troubled person and and he you know he had very troubled personal life and and i mean everybody who ever worked with him they thought he was one of the most brilliant people they ever played with, but they couldn't stand to be in the same room with him. You know, it was, he just, so, mm -hmm. he was just a weird, weird person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, so I was in school and Chuck left. Uh, he had a kind of a falling out with the school and I think his career was really taken off at the time. So he just decided to not uh, continue being uh, on the faculty there. And that's uh -huh. when his stuff really took off. And I, I did keep in touch with him. Uh, and I think it was in, 75 he was in town because he lived in rochester and right. uh, you know i'm still there and i don't know we met for lunch one day and we were talking and i i was just you know talking about what i was thinking about doing and he offered me a job uh of you know being his librarian and playing trumpet on some of his orchestral concerts um so i i started doing that uh and then at one and, and at the same time, I had been doing you know a lot of recording on my own. And, and so I was kind of familiar with the recording. And then one day he just said, uh, I'm going out to L.A. We're going to work on this album and I, I want you to come out and be in the studio. And mm -hmm. I said, OK, what what am I doing? He said, well, I just want you to be in the studio. I was like, OK. So I went out to L.A. and, uh, you know, ended up co-producing basically <laughs> before I even knew what the heck I was doing. And uh, 
so that kind of led led up to you know basically working with him for about seven years and mm -hmm. and working on production of uh, four or five of his recordings and I, I probably spent five thousand hours in the recording studio with this incredible engineer Mick Gozowski who at 14 years old recorded Chuck's first concert on a four track and uh -huh. it, and it became a Mercury Records hit you know uh, -huh. uh and then he went on to work with Barbara Streisand and you know all, all kinds of different artists he, amazing engineer and what an amazing run for me I'm 25 years old uh, 26. We're playing the Hollywood Bowl. There's 18,000 people there, or we're playing Red Rocks in Colorado doing a sunset sunrise concert, meaning uh, we're there at three in the morning doing a sound check. Uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're there at three in the afternoon doing a sound check, and then we do a concert starting at eight o'clock at night, and we go, you know, Chuck used to play a long time, so we go eight till 11 o'clock at night, and there's 10,000 people there. We go back to the hotel, come back at three in the morning to do another sound check, and we start a concert at six o'clock in the morning. There's another 10,000 people, and we play through Sunrise. Um, so I'm having these experiences wow. with him that were just unbelievable. You know, I mean, he was so hot at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and we ended up, you know, he was doing television shows, and I was kind of helping with a little bit of the you know, production on the, these television shows like the Midnight Special and, and, you know, different things. And we ended up on The Tonight Show a couple of times. And, uh, you know, so I toured with him f for a long time. And then, I don't know, it went sour at some point, you know. I do want to ask you about one of the albums, which was the live album, Live at the Hollywood Bowl. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I think that had, that had quite a few surprises. T tell me about that experience. Well, we... Uh, it's a really a risk taking experience to do it because of sound ordinances. Uh, you have to stop the concert at a certain time. I think the concert has to end at 11 o'clock at night because you're outside in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Uh, then the other thing is, you know, it's so expensive to hire LA musicians. I think we had a 70 piece orchestra and it's a one shot deal. This is not like, oh yeah, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna record and then we're gonna do it the next night and then the next night we're gonna have three nights to choose from. And you know, no way. This is like one and done. It's that's it. So, you know, we go in the morning or afternoon, do our our rehearsing, and they're getting the sound going and all that kind of thing. And uh, and I'm and I'm I'm producing uh, along with Chuck and and Mick is Gazowski is the engineer, uh, so I have I'm wearing a bunch of different hats and, and and also playing lead trumpet. So five minutes before we are supposed to go on stage, I mean, and push the red button, the entire <laughs> system goes down. Everything uh, goes down, and we're like, and we don't know if it's coming back. And here's an orchestra. Uh, we don't. You know, we're sitting here. We got to go. We don't know if it's coming back. And miraculously, I don't know if, if it was because of generators or or what they did. Miraculously, just before the concert started, that everything was able to come back up, and we proceeded. But man, that was that was an immediate heart attack just before we're going to do one thing. So then, of course, you know everybody on stage knows it's a live recording, and so everybody's really juiced to play. And as I remember, it was a really exciting evening. And at the end of the evening, I, I, I went to Mick and I, I said, you know, well, how do we make out? He said, well, uh, unfortunately, uh, James Bradley Jr., who is the drummer, he, he was so excited. He played so loud. It bled into all of the string mics. And you can barely, if I bring the strings up, you're just getting more drums. So we can, we're not really getting good presence on the strings. And he, and he said, and the other problem is, I'm sorry to tell you, but your mic wasn't working. The guy oh next to you, his mic was working. The guy next to him was working. So I, I heard you as we were doing it. But when I really got to check it, your mic wasn't on. So there's no presence. So we had to go back. Uh, I think we hired an 18-piece string section. And it ended up taking, I, as I remember, it was a good week at least of, of sessions. And we recorded strings uh with the entire 
you know, concert, all the, the whole concert again. And by the way, there's no click track or anything. You, we're in a room, Chuck's conducting or I'm conducting and we're getting, you know, the strings are hearing themselves play and we're trying to play with the concert so that we could at least push the faders up of the studio strings to give more presence to the strings. So that took a long time. It might have actually taken two weeks as far as I know. And then I had to go in and I had to play most of the concert over again. And it's really weird because you, not only do you have to sort of be with the orchestra, you have to be with yourself because otherwise you're getting a phase. It's kind of like lip syncing where, you know, it's musical lip syncing where the guy's talking and the, and his voice isn't quite with his lips. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had to, to go in for hours and hours and hours and play parts over so that it, I had the presence and it could be properly balanced. So yeah, that was amazing. It was an amazing experience. Yeah, it was cr crazy. From the landmarks in music, the Rochester Jazz Collection, that is the amazing Jeff Tyzik on trumpet with El Barrio. Now this is an outstanding recording with um, exceptional musicianship. What can you tell me about this particular piece? El Barrio was uh, a piece that actually only got released on one album, a very small printing, but it's one of my favorite pieces. I love that piece, and that's Peter Erskine playing drums on it. The great and weather report just, drummer. Yeah, and Peter's w w one of my idols and the fact that I could get him in the studio playing that piece. Yeah, it's cool. And I love Latin music. Uh, Latin music is one of my favorite music, uh, you know, styles to work with. Even today in classical music, I love classical Latin music. So I, I kind of I'm trying to get the energy. And of course, you know, at the end, I'm doing my big, you know, trumpet thing, uh, you know, up in that upper register with a kind of, which I must say with a pretty good fat sound up there. But, you know, it, it's it's complicated, but it's reflective at the same time. Uh, I think it's kind of an interesting piece. You can catch part two of my conversation with Jeff Tysick on the next episode of Life in the Grooves. And be sure to subscribe to our show by visiting our website at lifeinthegrooves.com or lifeinthegroovespodcast.com. Life in the Grooves is produced by Tour de Force Entertainment Group. If you like what you've heard, please take a moment to share, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. I'm Charles Urich. Thanks for listening.